Good morning slash afternoon slash evening, uh, fellow Replit enjoyers, uh, wherever you're coming out from the world. Uh, we are not coming at you live currently. Um, as you can see, this is a pre-recorded video um, because I'm away. So hello from the past, and I hope you're enjoying this uh, two days from now, because um, today we're going to be talking about the workspace, which is a very exciting part of Replit. Um, this is also take four of me trying to record this, so hopefully this one is actually uh, the right one and I can do this in one take, but if you end up seeing uh, slight cuts throughout the video, just know that um, I spent a lot of time in iMovie trying to make this good for you. Um, so just a little bit of an intro if you don't know who I am. Um, I'm Tyler. I'm a designer at Replit. Um, I've been here about two and a half years, uh, and currently I'm focusing a lot on the workspace and specifically um, and the, the workspace being uh, the kind of the place in Replit where you actually write code. It's what people uh, most know Replit for. Um, and we're specifically going to be talking about uh, building blocks, aka what are kind of the components and the parts of the workspace that uh, have to work together in order to give you um, kind of a unique coding experience. Um, how can we make those building blocks more flexible so that you can kind of adapt Replit to whatever uh, you might need during the day um, or whatever you're working on, uh, et cetera. So we'll dive into it um, and kind of what the full scope of that question actually means. Um, and if you read the slight subtext here, you can also see that we'll be talking about how Replit is uh, not an oven. Um, so stay tuned for what exactly that, that means, but I swear it's related to computers. Um, so let's step back a little bit um, and just ask, what, what is this all about? So, you know, saying that this is about workspace flexibility and, um, you know, these building blocks in the abstract, uh, it like kind of makes sense if you've been talking to us a little bit about this, but really um, what we're trying to answer here is uh, being able to make anything on Replit. Uh, th this is fundamentally what the goal of making the workspace more flexible and powerful is expanding what you can do, expanding what you can express, um, and expanding um, kind of the full breadth and um, width of uh, available projects that you can find on Replit to like remix from and, and uh, work on together with people. And if you look at the kind of array of projects uh, out on Replit today, um, you see, you already see a pretty wide range of what people are making. So I picked out a few examples from the community and from the team. You can see uh, a game from Spot and Jake. Uh, you can see a personal to-do app from uh, Lily. Um, Moody on our team, um, another designer and engineer, uh, made some interactive art using P5.js. Um, and this is an example from me kind of uh, visual visualizing how um, connections between words uh, can be uh, modeled using um, some statistical methods. Uh, so you have everything from games to you know personal software to kind of things that explore computer science and math concepts to just art. Um, and you know people are already making a bunch of other kinds of things, but I think the point here is that we can start to see Replit kind of approaching the universality uh, or generality of an operating system. Um, what does that mean? Operating systems like Mac OS or Windows or um, iOS kind of let you do a bunch of different things, whatever you want. You can play games, you can do your work, you can talk to people. Um, Replit is not quite there yet, but uh, the diversity and range of projects that we're starting to see emerge is suggesting this kind of forward push to Replit being a more, much more general purpose platform. But before we get there, you know, we have to see what does Replit actually look like today. Um, so we'll head over to the workspace. Here's a project that I've been working on. Um, and it is mainly about just kind of playing with different kinds of uh, graphics simulations, trying to make pretty art, um, that kind of thing, explore how systems like these, this work. Um, but if we look at the workspace, we can see I can write code over here. I can switch between different files. Maybe I want to look at my to-do list. Um, you know, I can have a kind of folder and file system like I would on my regular desktop. Um, I have all these different uh, packages that I can install, code that other people have written. Um, I can adjust settings of the workspace. Um, I can read my actual um, to-do file over here. But you know, ultimately, it's very obvious that this is like centered around coding. Uh, and for good reason, right? Replit is a platform that it, that's made for coding. What well, might not actually be obvious to uh, most people, 
when they see Replic for the first time is that it's actually a computer. Um, and what does that mean? Um, there are a few different products available online that you can use that are more like sandboxes, where they're kind of stripped down versions of what you might expect from a local development environment um, that allow you to do a very specific uh, kind of development, say it's for uh, websites or for exploring HTML and CSS. Um, but what Replit is under the hood is actually a computer. Um, and the way I can prove that to you is if we go into the shell, um, which is basically allowing us to access the underlying file system uh, that your REPL is connected to. And we can see that we can basically run Linux commands. Um, and the importance of this is not, you know, we're not trying to explain to people how Linux works specifically. Um, we're not, you know, marketing ourselves as a Linux product per se. But the point here is that Linux is kind of underpinning everything that we're doing here. So we are showing you kind of um, a layer on top of Linux that is specifically made for programming right now. But the point is that we have a full operating system under the hood um, with full access to a file system and all of its power uh, to build on top of. Um, so getting to the point where Replic can do much more general purpose things, um, whether you wanna play games or make music or make art, um, is just a matter of time, basically. All right, so now if we go back to look at uh, traditional operating systems like Linux, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, you can see here, they all kind of share similar uh, user interface and sign patterns. Um, what does that mean? When you turn your device on, what do you see? You see kind of like a flat surface um, with a bunch of little icons on them. And when you click on these icons, you can do different things. Uh, we commonly know these things as apps or applications. Um, and the idea is that there's kind of this base level of software that comes kind of pre-installed with whatever device that you're using. And then you can install other apps on top of it to actually do specific things that, you know, the original authors of the operating system did not uh, intend for. There's a system that allows for this kind of range of um, different functionality to be built on top of it. Um, and I think the, the main idea that we're trying to communicate here is that while Replit is not that today, um, Replit could very much be that tomorrow. Um, so, you know, we're not gonna show you designs immediately of what that looks like. Um, and you know what it look, might look like in five years. Patience is a virtue. Um, so let's just give a little bit more context before we go into some actual prototypes. The main issue with comparing us to kind of traditional operating systems like Mac OS or Windows um, is that their model of sharing and creation is uh, fundamentally closed off to the rest of the world. Um, so we see this, you know, this is just a screenshot from, from Apple. Um, and it might seem great at first, right? You know, everything is well designed. Uh, everything kind of works with each other. You have this ecosystem that like works seamlessly between devices. Um, but, you know, the kind of immediate question of like, okay, well, you know, messages maybe doesn't work exactly how I want it to, right? Um, you know, I, for example, a lot of people have been complaining for a while that you can't mark a message as unread in iMessage, right? How come you can't add that feature yourself, right? If you want to change how the grid looks in, in a FaceTime like this, uh, how come you can't do that yourself, right? You're, you're kind of dependent on the development and the, and the design teams of these platforms to uh, see any kind of incremental improvement. Um, so fundamentally, the kind of app ecosystem that is built around all these operating systems is closed off um, from modification. Obviously, if you become a developer, which is an entire process in itself, uh, not to mention, you know, learning how to code, learning uh, all of the APIs and um, development kits that you need to actually create software for these platforms, the actual like time that you need to ramp up to be able to publish something and get it approved and get into the hands of users, um, as opposed to just making something for yourself and maybe your friends and family is very, very high. So the main take home point here is that these systems are amazing. Um, they're extremely sophisticated, but the fundamental issue is that they are closed. They are closed off um, to the rest of the world. You can develop apps for them, but the restrictions around uh, publishing and being able to modify existing software uh, and being able to inspect them and see the, the, the source code behind the scenes, um, being, being able to actually understand what's going on um, is largely just left to you know, these, uh, this elite circle at the top of the development hierarchy essentially. Um, so 
what could a world look like where software is more open uh, by default uh, and the software that you use is more um, inspectable. This is kind of ironic because the early web was actually extremely open and individualistic. Um, and if we look at some example websites from back in the day, you know, eBay and NASA and Yahoo, for example, um, we can see that they are all kind of just doing their own thing. Um, you know, it was fun, like everybody was just figuring it out. Um, you know, development was relatively open, you know, it was still extremely hard to figure out how, how to get actually anything up on the web, but um, there was this kind of group mentality that everybody was just figuring it out. And if we go back and look at some of the like really early computing days, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, we're looking at an IBM, old IBM 360 machine here. Um, even time sharing, aka like using the same computer between multiple people, aka multiplayer to some degree, um, was a very early trend. Um, and it's something that we've been exploring for a long time. So it's kind of ironic that, you know, there's almost been like a regression in terms of like the standards that we hold computing and software to. Uh, and, you know, we kind of want to uh, return to these old traditions, aka let's make the internet cozy again. Let's make it feel personal, make it feel open. Uh, make it feel like you can make whatever you want and it doesn't need to be like extremely polished um, for people to find value out of it. Um, it doesn't need to be uh, this kind of huge ordeal to publish and share stuff with each other and make things. So um, fundamentally, what's, what's, what's the plan here? What's the actual first step to getting from the current workspace that we see to a place where the internet is more cozy? I think that the kind of first answer here is just letting people do more than just code. Um, and what does that mean in context? Um, as you can see, there's a picture of a kitchen here. You might, a light bulb might be dinging off about the, the oven reference earlier. Um, but what's fundamental to understanding coding is understanding that uh, the actual physical typing of code is only one component of the project, right? You're reading docs, you're watching a tutorial, um, you're maybe like talking to your collaborators, you're going out and like looking for, for stuff on the internet for you know previous references that you might want to find. Um, you're looking for people to work with. Uh, it's actually very similar to a kitchen. Um, you know, the kitchen is not purely about the ingredients, right? And like putting things into a pan or, or a pot. It's about the layout of the kitchen. It's about who's in the kitchen with you. Um, it's about, you know, what recipe are you actually following? And, you know, are you excited about the meal that you're making today? Um, it's, you know, the kitchen is this extremely multi-purpose environment, um, and it's not just a single purpose tool, right? The kitchen as a general purpose environment has many, many tools inside of it and many kinds of people that can work inside of it to accomplish different tasks. So we think that the kind of future of the workspace is about acknowledging that uh, people's creative processes can be extremely different, extremely varied, um, and they rely on a more general purpose environment as opposed to a kind of single purpose, you know, very focused tool um, for accomplishing one kind of activity. Um, and when we zoom out a little bit, literally, we can see that kitchens themselves, you know, at an environmental level can also be extremely different. You can have something that's extremely homey and used for, you know, just friends and family and it's a social space uh, versus, you know, a more industrial kitchen where it's main uses in a restaurant or, or something. It, it's for, for some kind of professional use case where you have like a very rigid, regimented setup for how the people operate inside of it, where, where things go. Um, this might be more akin to a company uh, where, you know, they have very elaborate processes set up in place for how software is built and how people collaborate in whatever environments they're using. But I think the take home point here, uh, and here's the allusion to earlier, is that uh, Replit is not an oven. Replit is the kitchen. Um, Replit is not a tool specifically. Replit is a place that contains tools. Um, and it is more specifically a place that contains tools that you can combine in different ways to accomplish whatever you need to do. Um, and that's kind of the future that we're heading towards. So more specifically, there's kind of like three areas that we want to focus on to like bring this to life. Um, and these aren't mutually exclusive, but, and they're all kind of related to each other, but um, I figured it was helpful to break it down into this. So one is customization, AKA generally letting people uh, make Replit fit into their needs and personal workflows. So, you know, if you want to make a game or if you want to write a tutorial, um, or if you want to watch a tutorial or play a game, uh, kind of the opposite side of that spectrum, uh, Replit should be able to accommodate you 
um, for all those use cases. Um, the second one is extensions. So, you know, fundamentally having this base layer like we were talking about in an operating system upon which other things are built um, is going to be key to kind of the breadth of software that will, that will be able to be built. And lastly, um, very tactically development. So what are the specific APIs and kind of the, um, the vertical integration that we give people, aka what are the tools that we give you all at once that you can use all together that work very, very well together on Replit to be able to build new kinds of software. So things like databases or payments or multiplayer um, or you know, access to your, to your device sensors. Um, how can we make that all kind of Replit native uh, and very easy to access from basically any programming language or environment? But today's talk is mainly focused on the customization part and um, how that will end up looking like in, in the workspace. Kind of the, the main question we have to ask ourselves here is what is the root of a flexible customizable system, right? If you want your system, whatever you're looking at to be flexible and personalizable, uh, what do you have to focus on first? The answer is building blocks. Um, so what you see here is something that looks very similar to the current workspace with a few kind of changes. Um, you might notice that, you know, instead of just looking at code, um, we have a little YouTube tutorial open up here. What's that about? Um, we also have audio chat down here. So I'm collaborating with uh, my colleague, Lena, who's guiding me through the tutorial and what to actually look at in my code. Um, you can see instead of just a file tree, I have a navigator, which kind of summarizes um, all the things that I have available in, in the workspace specifically. Uh, and on the left side, you see a doc that kind of might remind you of an app doc in a traditional operating system. Um, so while this might not look super different from the current workspace, as you saw earlier, uh, the key differences here is that uh, we're focusing a lot on generality and the idea of like building these kind of core um, components of our user interface that are flexible and can be adapted to different use cases. So if we step back a little bit and look outside of the workspace, you know, we can see that these are all kind of similar in a lot of different ways. Uh, they're all basically just containers for content. You can see that they all have a label um, and they all have, um, they can all be resized in different ways and, and used uh, kind of in similar ways in, inside of the actual workspace user interface. All right, so this basically begs the question of what actually are our primitives? Um, as you saw, uh, one part of it is uh, panes, aka just containers of content that you see inside of the workspace that can be adapted to different things. Um, they're basically just things that you see inside of the actual user interface of the workspace um, that let you do different things. Um, on a traditional desktop, that might mean, you know, windows and things that you see that uh, basically contain different apps. Um, but, you know, getting the basics right for how these things work is really important for how the system works as a whole. Um, on top of panes, you'll have popovers, which is basically content that's overlaid um, and an entirely new concept that we're dealing with, um, which is not totally flushed out, but something we'll, we'll mention is spaces, which is um, groups of panes that uh, can be uh, saved for later to basically return to different tasks and, and switch between different modes of working. So let's look at a little bit about what's actually inside of the pane. You have your pane header with, with um, kind of a standard set of actions that you might notice uh, are very similar to an operating system you have to maximize or minimize or close whatever you're doing. Uh, you have a label, um, which basically describes what content you're actually seeing inside of it. Um, and it's kind of like a command that you enter that uh, renders um, the appropriate content right underneath. And then you actually have the content. So in this case, it's file code. Uh, and the main idea here is that every file or tool that you use will be contained within a pane. Um, we'll obviously have some smaller uh, primitives um, or some smaller concepts that deal with things that don't necessarily need a user interface, but uh, this is kind of the fundamental part of it. As far as pop-ups go, you might be used to seeing them from product tours or uh, tooltips, um, but fundamentally, popovers are about being able to overlay rich content on top of whatever um, primary user interface element you're looking at. So in this case, you might have a, uh, a thread, aka a comment on top of code that is uh, overlaid on mobile. You might have um, a uh, code suggestion from an AI on top of a highlighted piece of code, or you might be able to access secondary actions from uh, the doc. So what's inside of a space? Um, 
spaces we're not going to go over uh, super in depth right now, but basically it, spaces are kind of similar to desktops on um, a traditional operating system. So kind of uh, collections of uh, apps and um, windows that you might see together uh, for accomplishing a specific task. So let's say you want to test out your website. Let's say you're debugging in another space. Let's say you have a space open from your phone. Um, and let's say, you know, you want to observe somebody else's space uh, who's currently working um, on some other part of the project. This is still very much in development, but this is kind of the main new concept that we're dealing with um, to accommodate the kind of range of tasks that you might need to accomplish within a particular uh, working session. We're going to skip over this uh, for now, and we're just going to go straight into showing you kind of um, what some of these user interface patterns might look like. So. This is the kind of uh, current workspace, um, but we've been working on um, this new prototype um, for seeing how you can actually manipulate the windows inside of the workspace. So, you know, I can resize as normal, um, but I can also um, now take out um, panes and move them around and, and rearrange the workspace to focus on whatever I want. So let's say I just want to focus on debugging the actual visual output. I can, I can delete the file tree if I want. Um, let's say I want to uh, make this look a little bit more like an iPad. I can do that as well. Um, I can shrink the spacing a lot more if I want to. Um, and now I can just, you know, focus on my game entirely. Um, if I refresh, now we're back to kind of the main workspace. Um, but you know, the point is that you can kind of mix and match and rearrange um, the workspace as you see fit. Um, if I want to switch panes, I can actually look for different uh, files here. Um, and I can easily search from within a pane. Um, but, you know, the overall point here is that the workspace is flexible. You can rearrange content however you want. Um, and the actual different kinds of content that you want to see in front of you um, are all accessible via the same controls. So whether you have a web view or debugger or settings or, or you need a tutorial, um, it's all available to you uh, through, the, through the same user interface. One question you might have is how does mobile work in this case? Um, and the, the simple answer here is that it's basically the same as desktop, um, but just with you know a few modifications to how you actually see panes and interact with them. Um, so I just wanted to show uh, kind of a mobile demo. So we're on mobile now. Um, and just as a comparison, if I can click on this file, I can uh, scroll through here, I can type. Um, I can uh, do everything as I normally would. If I want to expand back out, I just click the little panes button um, and I can go and look at my output. Um, I can test it again. If I want to run something in the console, I can. Um, but you can see that the kind of core here is the same between desktop and mobile. We're sharing the same concept of panes. We're sharing the same concept that uh, you can uh, search for files um, and delete panes if you want to. You can rearrange them. Um, but the idea is that it's on kind of this uh, shrunken and focused user interface that it's made specifically for mobile. Um, but at the core, they're sharing the same primitives. But the important part about this is that, you know, if you have a complicated user interface, um, and you're working with people across different devices in different parts of the world, uh, you can seamlessly transition between working on mobile and working on desktop. Uh, and the reason it's important for us is because it allows us to move faster as a development and design team. It allows us to share infrastructure and code between uh, different parts of the code base, and it allows us to open up basically this world where, um, you know, if people want to customize Replit um, to, you know, a million different use cases, uh, basically their, their device and uh, computing power <laughs> available shouldn't be a limiting factor. Um, whether you're on a cheap smartphone or you're on you know, a $4,000 MacBook, uh, you're able to work on the same project together uh, at any point. And the reason that sharing code and infrastructure is important for us is because um, it allows us to move faster on design and development. It allows us to share patterns between uh, mobile and desktop very easily. It allows us to um, 
think about problems kind of in the same lens between uh, different de devices and form factors and, and uh, people from different parts of the world. There are many people whose only devices are phones, for example. Likewise, there are many people who only have uh, Chromebooks that they're given in schools. Um, and ideally, you know, if you have people who are meeting each other from across the world, they want to collaborate on something, um, the actual hardware um, and form factor available to them is not a limitation to them being able to meet and collaborate. Um, so besides just making it easier for us to actually create software that is adaptable, um, it opens up an entire world of collaboration for our users. So let's do a quick recap. Um, basically, Replit will become an operating system. Uh, I think the point here is that it's not just about code, but the entire creative process um, and Replit becoming kind of a general purpose creative tool. Um, there are many points that actually lead into that future. Um, one of them being apps, one of them being a kind of uh, heavy extension system, one of them being uh, really, really good development tools that make it easy to develop on apps and to incentivize people to make Replit specific software. But the thing that we focused on today is building powerful, flexible building blocks, AKA primitives, um, that enable us to create flexible workspaces that enable uh, end users to be able to um, customize the workspace to fit their needs. Um, and because of that, we need to remind you again that Replit is not an oven. Replit is the kitchen. Um, Replit is not a specific tool for a specific use case. You can customize it to do specific things, but the primary idea here is that it is a general purpose environment. It is for doing many things and for um, existing inside of, as opposed to a thing that you use for a very specific task. So um, general purpose creative system, uh, powerful and flexible primitives, and Replit is not an oven. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening to me talk. Hopefully there aren't too many cuts because I had to edit out a bunch of things. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.